I want to thank you again for your incredible attention this morning. And I, I had something I wanted to talk to you about. Um, and there are just times that I think these, these things are important for us to do. Um, for the last couple of weeks, I've been very aware that God's been really moving in some special ways in my own life. A week ago, Tuesday, so almost two weeks ago, I woke up about 3 o'clock in the morning praying about some special needs that we have as a church. And in my prayer time, I, you know, prayed for a while until I really didn't have anything else to say. And it's my custom in the middle of the night when I have those prayer times to just sit down and say, God, I want you to speak to my spirit and really direct my thoughts and help my understanding of these things to be clarified. And I felt like whenever I was doing that, the guy began speaking to me about really some things I talked about the previous weekend in the message and two weekends ago. Um, you know, I shared 1 Corinthians 2 9, where Paul says that eyes have never seen, ears have never heard, the mind has never conceived the things that God has for us, and how that daring faith believes God to do the impossible. And then I used Joshua 1 and the principles there to illustrate that kind of a thing because no one ever heard of those kinds of things happening. And so uh, God began to speak to me about really kind of from that. And, you know, I began to see as I was sitting there in the dark of my den listening to God, that God was really speaking to me about something in relationship to the flooded Jordan River, which separated Israel, you know, from the wilderness side of the Jordan into the promised land side. And I felt like that, that, that God was really speaking to me from some of that, but it was not clear to me what he was really showing me. And so I prayed about it for a while longer, and I felt like God just said, listen, Rick, I'll clarify it for you. Just give me time. So I went back to bed and actually went back to sleep. And um, through the day on Tuesday, God began to clarify some things. And by Wednesday morning, he had, I think, crystallized some things in my mind. What he helped me to understand is this, that what I was sensing was the Jordan River, flooded Jordan River, that separated Israel on the Jordanian and wilderness side from the promised land. For the grace place really involves several things. It involves, um, you know, last year, God helped us from a financial perspective to end the year in a really positive way. We had some wonderful end-of-the-year contributions that came in that God really used in a special way, um, and we're thankful for that. But for whatever set of reasons, we went from that incredible month of blessing in December to really some challenging things financially that happened in January and February, and offerings were below our budget needs are about $30,000 a week, and our offerings were, you know, in the low 20s um, for about seven or eight of those weeks. And so it means that it creates some real financial challenges. And, and I'm feeling the stress of that every day right now. And, and so I was praying about all that. And I felt like God said, you know, Rick, part of the flood of Jordan River that you're seeing is really that whole challenging area there. And then incorporated into that is, you know, we're going into the summer months here in another month or two. And... Summer in South Florida, and really has very little to do with winter residents. It's just summer in South Florida is what I call the summer crazies. And it really affects the financial, um, you know, the financial aspects of the church. And so, you know, I've got that, you know, I've been here in June, it'll be 23 years. So I've got plenty of experience working our way through these summer months and knowing the challenges it produces. And so... I feel like God said, you know, Rick, you know that, that there's at least another hundred to hundred twenty five thousand dollars that needs to come in really to to make sure we go into the summer months and don't deal with those big time challenges that just seem to occur predictably. And um, and then, you know, the roof on the ministry center, if you've been over there when it rains, you know that it's got some problems. That's the middle building. And um, and that's about a $75,000 repair job because it involves not only the roof, but because there's roof-mounted air conditioners, then many of those 
whenever you take them off, the bottoms are rusting and you can't put them back down because it creates, you just can't do it because they fall apart basically. And um, so, you know, there's a lot of money in putting new air conditioners on that. So all those things are involved and I'm looking at it and saying, we've got that. And then, you know, we, we have this project in Port St. Lucie that, that we took on a year and a half ago. And when we did, we had a Hispanic ministry that we'd started in 2008. And, you know, they were meeting in our chapel building. And, um, but about two thirds of the people who are part of that ministry were coming from Port St. Lucie. So, you know, our plan was when we did this was we would start a Saturday evening, Hispanic ministry there, Sunday morning here, continue that. And then we had a Haitian ministry that was a part of our church in Port St. Lucie. And so they would go and utilize that at like nine o'clock on Sunday. And then we would do an English service at 11. Well, over a period of about six weeks, the Haitian pastor came to me and told me that he felt like he needed to go into missions ministry with Haiti and not be a pastor. And the Hispanic pastor and his wife decided that they wanted to go on their own. So they did that. And um, so it's kind of like, wow, what in the world's going on with this? And I'd met with the Haitian ministry and, you know, and I, I realized that I'm not the best equipped person to be hiring Haitian pastors. First of all, I don't understand the culture well enough to understand the nuances of things that are needed to, to do those kinds of things for a ministry like that. And then discussing it with them, it's pretty obvious they felt like that the Grace Place, the English version, was kind of imposing strategies that they were uncomfortable with. So talking to Pastor Bronze and to them, we decided to be better to let them, um, you know, we helped them get their 51C3 status as an independent ministry back. And so all those things happened. And then we developed a relationship with Pastor Jose Ria, who pastors a very large church in Marquisa Meto, um, Venezuela. And so our plan was for him to start a Hispanic ministry there in, um, in Fort St. Lucie. Well, over a period of time, he developed a passion for doing ministry primarily to Venezuelans and Colombians in Weston and Orlando. And he's talked to me about that. And so we released him to go do ministry in those areas. So that kind of took care of that. And so we're looking at it and saying, you know, this is one of those things where, uh, and I share this with you because I think you just need to know what's going on with it. And so we've been praying about it and we had about, about, about a month ago where I've been praying about that whole thing with Port St. Lucie. And I had a, a pastor I've known for many years who contacted me and he is working with a church there as an associate pastor. And that church has really been growing and they've so outgrown their facilities that they're having to do their children's ministry in a tent. And so he talked to me about th that facility. And you know, our passion has been to start a ministry in that part of Port St. Lucie that really would reflect the kind of values that we have as a church. And, and this ministry does that. And so they talked to me about that. I met with them and I've had several meetings with them. But I had a meeting with them yesterday. Now here's the thing, I t when I was talking to the elders, and to the staff. Whenever Israel was confronted by that overflowing Jordan River, you remember what they did? Moses said, or Joshua said to the people, get ready, we're going to cross over the Jordan. And then he said um, that he wanted the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant to put their feet in the edge of the Jordan River. And when they did, God miraculously opened a way through the Jordan River. It wasn't going to happen having another prayer meeting on the other side of the Jordan River. It happened. So I, told, I talked to the elders and to the staff. I asked them to all be a part of what God began crystallizing as what we would call the 12 stone project. And all of them are participating. And so, and what that means is that in about four or five weeks, we'll ask you to pray right now what God may want you to do. And we'll do a four month project to really address all of those things we're talking about. 
And so we got, so, so that's where we're at. And once, you know, once, once they got on the other side of the Jordan River, river before they went in and possessed the land what joshua did was set up 12 stones and he said that people would say in future generations what are those 12 stones there for and it would be that they would say it's a reminder that god does what he promises to do and he brought us safely through the jordan river when it was flooded so that's where the whole 12 stone project came from and so so i felt like god just been saying you know, we've got to get beyond this flooded Jordan River to get into the place that he wants us to be to be able to experience the kind of development and the kind of blessings and the kind of growth he wants to give our church. And I believe that to be very true and extremely important. So I had a meeting yesterday with these two pastors, the senior pastor and associate pastor. The building that they own will be closed on June the 3rd they're interested in signing a lease, a sublease from us and developing that ministry there. They have about 100 people attending that ministry right now and they believe it will double and triple over the next, you know, over the next months as it gets started. And I think they're right. So I feel like the God's saying, I've already diminished the Jordan, the flooded Jordan River quite a bit already by that. And I want to encourage us to pray about what God wants us to do Nobody's going to be pushing you or pestering you. It's just presenting it to you and saying, let's do what we can do together to get in to the land of promise and see God doing the kind of things that we believe he wants us to do as a church. If we'll do that. We're going to experience blessings on our church like we've never experienced before. But it doesn't happen. I felt like God said, Rick, you can, you know, we have prayer circles praying for all these things. You've got to get your feet in the Jordan River. You got to put the seed in the ground before the harvest comes. Is that right? What we've been talking about. So I want to encourage you to pray about it. I know if you will, that God will bless you in a special way. And I believe God's got phenomenal things for us as a church. And what we're dealing with are not things we've never dealt with before. But I think God would like to help us to get beyond that and to experience a, a phase of ministry of incredible blessings and opportunity He has in front of us. So I want to encourage you to just pray with us about that if you would, okay?